We'll come to order. We um, are very proud to have two of our nation's leaders uh, this morning present and uh, for the introduction purposes, I appreciate both of you being here, but we have a request from Senator Kane to, to participate in the introduction of General Berger. Senator Kane. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to Ranking Member Reed and to my colleagues. This feels different looking at you from this angle, but it is. Is it better or worse? <laughs> uh, I'm taking the fifth on that one, Mr. Chair. Um, it is a real honor for me to have the chance to introduce uh, Lieutenant General David Berger, who's the President's nominee to be the 38th Commandant of the Marine Corps. Uh, General Berger is a Virginian. Uh, his parents live in Virginia and are here with us today. He spent a lot of quality time in the Commonwealth of Virginia training at Quantico and also uh, a stint as a Marine recruiter in the Roanoke area. We are very, very proud in Virginia to be the home of training for every Marine officer and also the National Museum of the Marine Corps at Quantico. During his 38 years as a Marine, General Berger has served in many capacities, including deployments to Kuwait, Haiti, Iraq, Kosovo and Afghanistan. After serving as commander of U.S. Marine Corps Forces Pacific, he was appointed to his current role as commanding general of the Marine Corps Combat Development Command. General Berger is well positioned, well suited to serve as commandant of the Marine Corps because of his Marine service, but he's also well suited to work in joint operations with the other service chiefs. In addition to his Marine training, General Berger is also a graduate of the U.S. Army Ranger Corps School, the U.S. Army Jump Master School, and the U.S. Navy Dive School. I don't know whether the Air Force didn't have something that you could, that, that, that suited your personality. Uh, finally, General Berger is no stranger to the committee. He's testified before us often, especially in the readiness subcommittee, and he's earned a reputation before this committee for telling it like it is, which we appreciate. It's an honor to support General Berger, and I'll add in also my support for Admiral Moran for the CNO position. To the committee, thanks for the opportunity to introduce this fine public servant. Thank you, Senator Kane, and we all share your um, enthusiasm and your feelings about our two leaders here today. It's an honor to have them both here. And we would expect them, when they have, are, are recognized, to introduce any family that's here with them. Um, we have our, our standard seven questions that have to be answered. They have to be answered audibly, so I'm asking each one of you to respond in, uh, in the way so we can get through this thing. Have you adhered to applicable laws and regulations governing conflicts of interest? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Will you ensure that your staff complies with deadlines established for requested communications, including questions for the record and hearings? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Will you cooperate and provide witnesses and briefers in response to the congressional uh, requests? I will. I will. Will those witnesses be protected from reprisal for their testimony and briefings? They yes, will. Sir. Do you agree, if confirmed, to appear and testify upon request before this committee? Yes, sir. Do you agree to provide the documents, including copies of electronic forms and communications in a timely manner when requested by a duly constituted committee, or to consult with the committee regarding the basis for any good faith delay or denial in providing such documents? Yes sir. yes, sir. And lastly, have you assumed any duties or undertaken any actions which would appear to presume the outcome of the confirmation process? No, sir. No, I have not. Thank you very much. Um, the the uh, National Defense Strategy directs our nation's military to prepare for the return of the great power competition. This means we've got to be prepared to deter and, if necessary, to def decisively defeat uh, those near-peer adversaries, and obviously I'm talking about China and Russia. In order for the Department of the Navy to achieve that goal, our Navy and Marine Corps must be manned, trained, and equipped appropriately. Uh, with our reduced defense budget during the Obama administration and with uh, the alarming uh, speed of the modernization of both China and Russia in, um, in, in, in conventional and nuclear forces, it presents a formidable threat to America and our allies. Our next CNO and Commandant will be relied upon to modernize 
our naval forces while at the same time rebuild readiness. I urge you both to take a long view. Technical uh, risks must be better understood before procuring new systems. Without better acquisition performance, which has been a problem for uh, many, many years, our challenges will get worse and not better. We will fall behind and further behind our competitors. At Mor uh, Moran, I'm uh, concerned that nine of 11 advanced weapon elevators on the USS Gerald Ford still don't work. Uh, leadership lessons don't appear to have been followed. I talked to you about this before. This is not your fault, but it's something that we addressed in some detail, thinking we were resolving the problem back during the consideration of the NDAA uh, 17. So we'll talk a little bit about that. General Berger, the Marine Corps participated in the counterinsurgency fight over the last 17 years. It has done extremely well. However, I'm concerned about the toll that it has taken on the readiness of the Marine Corps, uh, our equipment and the training uh, to deter and, if necessary, to win against the peer threats like China and Russia. Again, the two of you are not responsible for the problems we've had in the past, but you are responsible for the solutions that we look for during the course of this here. Uh, Senator Reid. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I also want to welcome Admiral Moran and Lieutenant General Berger to this confirmation here regarding their nominations to be the chiefs of their respective services. I want to thank both of you gentlemen for your exemplary service to the nation and for your willingness to continue to serve. I also want to thank your families who also serve along with you for their dedication and support, which is so critical to the success of our military. Admiral Moran, you have an exemplary record of service and are well qualified to be the Chief of Naval Operations. As the present Vice Chief of Naval Operations, you have been intricately involved in all aspects of the Navy from personnel to acquisition. Lieutenant General Berger, you likewise have an outstanding record of service, currently serving as the Commanding General Marine Corps Combat Development Command and Deputy Commandant for Combat Development and Integration. You are well versed in shaping the Marine Corps for the future which will serve you well as the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Admiral Moran, if confirmed as Chief of Naval Operations, you will be tasked with recruiting and retaining a quality force and ensuring that force contains the necessary structure and readiness levels to meet our nation's current challenges and the posture to respond to tomorrow's threats. The Navy is already challenged to procure needed ships on time and on budget and this challenge will be compounded by the need to recapitalize the ballistic missile submarine fleet that was built in the 1980s. In addition, if you are confirmed, you will have to face the challenge of implementing programs to improve readiness and professionalism in the Navy's fleet to avoid preventable accidents like the USS McCain and the USS Fitzgerald. Al Moran, I will be interested in your vision of the Navy and how you go about making that vision a reality. General Berger, if confirmed as Commandant of the Marine Corps, you will be tasked with recruiting and retaining a quality force and shaping that force for new roles against near-peer competitors while maintaining readiness to meet our nation's current challenges. This is a daunting task for a small force in fiscally constrained times, and again, I'm interested in your plan for accomplishing such tasks. We live in tumultuous times, and many core values are being tested. I'm concerned that such times can have a corrosive effect on our military personnel. It has never been more important that our Navy and Marine Corps have principal leaders who promote respect throughout the ranks and adhere to a moral code that can serve as an example to all our sailors and Marines. And Moran and General Berger, we all expect and expect uh, and demand, in fact, that you will be those leaders. I'm confident you will. Again, thank you for your commitment to the nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Reid. We'll start with you, Admiral, and uh, try to keep your remarks brief. And you'll have uh, ample opportunity to cover all subjects, I'm sure. And uh, we'll follow with uh, General Berger, Admiral Moran. Thank you, uh, Chairman Inhofe, Senator Reid, and the distinguished members of this committee. It's an honor to appear before you this morning as the nominee for Chief of Naval Operations. And I'm grateful for the confidence expressed by the President of the United States, uh, our Secretary, uh, Acting Secretary of Defense Shanahan, Secretary Spencer, and of course, our Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral John Richardson. The opportunity to continue serving this country is, frankly, deeply humbling. Uh, but before I get started, Senator, if you don't mind, I'd just like to acknowledge the fact that we lost a, an important Navy man on Sunday, 
a true gentleman and a patriot to this country. Senator Luger was an important voice in our national security issues during a long and distinguished career. He will be missed by this body, I'm sure, uh, but even more so, he'll be missed by his shipmates in the Navy. Uh, as you know well, uh, nominees don't get here alone. Uh, we are supported and carried by many individuals and teams along the way. And at the very top of that list is the lady behind me, my wife Patricia. Uh, we've been together for over 36 years now, and uh, she's been my rock and my foundation for the entire time in my career in the Navy. And like so many other Navy spouses, she deserves all the credit for raising two amazing kids and for now keeping our three grandkids perfectly spoiled. <laughs> My, our son Will is here. He came in all the way from San Diego. Uh, he also serves in the Navy, and he is less than a month away from yet another deployment. Our daughter Jessica and her son, or her uh, husband, John, are traveling up from Raleigh, North Carolina with their three sons, our three grandsons, Benjamin, Teddy, and Lincoln, and we thought it best that they not be here this morning, um, so they're back at the house. I'm also uh, very grateful that my brother Mike is, is here. He's approaching 35 years of service in the Navy, and I am very fortunate to be able to serve alongside him at this moment. I also want to honor my parents. Uh, both were amazing public school teachers and administrators. They were coaches and mentors to thousands of young men and women. And while they have passed on, uh, their legacy of kindness, compassion, and service guides me each and every day. It's for all of them, my family, and thousands of classmates, shipmates, squadron mates uh, from all over the country and all parts of the world that this calling is such a great honor to be nominated for this position on their behalf. It's a particular pr privilege to share this moment with uh, Lieutenant General Dave Berger. Now, we have just begun to get to know each other in preparing for this hearing, uh, but I have learned in that very short time that we share a couple core beliefs. The first is uh, the unique responsibility and capacity of naval forces to advance our nation's security and prosperity. The second is the importance of maintaining and continuing to build the most powerful naval force on the planet. And if confirmed, I look forward to working closely with Dave to advance naval power together. Today, there are over 65,000 men and women who are deployed forward, uh, who are on the watch for the American people and for each other. Every other sailor and Navy civilian back home also stands to watch, training and preparing to lead through the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. Many of you have recently visited these young men and women at sea, on the ground in foreign countries, in hostile and friendly territory, and in the world's busiest sea lanes. And I cannot imagine that these young patriots, these volunteers, failed to impress you. In every way, they embody a unique and truly American form of service. They are your Navy team, a team that strives every single day to grow and improve and live up to the nation's expectations as they support and defend the Constitution of the United States. To be war fighters, to be tested, and to lead. To continually push forward, confident and proud of what they do. So if confirmed, my pledge to you to, and to them and to our families is to work tirelessly to develop and deploy the finest naval warfighting team anywhere. You have my word that I will continue to devote myself to these sacred obligations with everything that I have. And as a member of the Joint Chiefs, I pledge to bring my experiences in my military and personal judgment to bear and to provide my best professional advice to the Secretary, the Chairman, and the President. To those ends, I will strive to deliver decisive and ready naval forces whose power emanates from the genius of our people and extends to a network of naval allies and partners around the globe. This is what navies are all about. And finally, Mr. Chairman, I will always avail myself to this committee and to the Congress at large as we work together to safeguard our nation's security and prosperity. Thank you, sir, and I look forward to your question. Excellent statement, uh, Admiral Moran. General Berger. Chairman Inhofe, uh, Ranking Member Reed, 
and distinguished members of the committee, thanks for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'm truly honored to be nominated as the 38th Commandant of the Marine Corps. Here with me today is my wife, Donna, who has given as much to the Marine Corps over the past 38 years that we've been married as anybody I know, including me. Through all the deployments and all the PCS moves, she's been a tireless advocate of military spouses and their families, and has immersed herself completely in every unit we've served in. From the highs of the happy deployment homecomings to the lows of combat losses and casualty assistance calls to young spouses in the middle of the night. Not only is she a great mother, uh, for our uh, four sons, she saw two of her boys join the Marines. One son went to Iraq, the other to Afghanistan, and I honestly don't think Donna slept a full night uh, when each one was deployed. Three of our sons are here with us uh, this morning, and Don and I are really incredibly proud, like Admiral Moran is, uh, of each one of them and their families. They each have made their own way in life, and their success is really heartwarming to me and Donna. Also with me today are my mom and dad. They are my role models in life, and probably my biggest supporters. I have a brother and a sister here and a whole bunch of other family and friends as well, and Don and I are just really tickled that uh, they could be here this morning. I am grateful to this committee for your resolve and your unwavering support for our service members and, as the uh, ranking member Reed said, for their families. Our men and women in uniform need to know that their nation is fully behind them, and your actions reflect that steadfast support in our, from our citizenry. I know that we have the best trained, the best equipped, best led force I've seen in my lifetime. We also have the very best leaders setting the tone out in front of them, setting the personal example in everything that they do. Some of those commanders with full knowledge that some of the decisions they must make in combat put human lives at risk. It is humbling just to serve among their ranks. General Neller, over the past four years, skillfully guided our Corps through some challenging times as we recovered from more than a decade of sustained combat in the Middle East and shifted our focus back towards our naval roots. That we have largely recovered our combat readiness while concurrently beginning to modernize the Marine Corps for the future is a testament to the clarity of General Neller's vision and his steady hand at the helm. And I am grateful for his leadership his mentorship and his friendship. Your Marine Corps fills a unique role in the defense of our nation. As General Krulak once said, we make Marines and we win battles. We typically do not win wars. Our goal is always to go quickly. We will be first to fight and do all humanly possible to prevent a crisis from becoming a war. When it comes to national defense, your nation's Marines are the first responders, and much is expected of them. We must be ready at all times, highly trained, expeditionary in nature. We must be both lethal and compassionate, for we will not have the luxury of choosing the next conflict or the crisis. This nation demands the highest professional standards of her Marines, and we are accountable for our actions to you and to them. These are not unreasonable demands, and we work very hard to keep our honor clean. If confirmed as the Commandant of the Marine Corps, I will ensure that Marines live up to the expectations of this committee and the American people 24-7. I will ensure your Marines are always ready to go when called, but I will also look after their welfare and care for their families so that we return better citizens to society when they complete their time in uniform. I will maintain a focus on proper care and support for our ill and injured and those wounded in combat. I can think of no greater honor than to continue to serve among their ranks and lead them as the 38th Commandant. Thanks again for the opportunity to appear before you this morning, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, General Berger, and thank you for your service. For your opening statement. Let's start with you, uh, Admiral Moran. Uh, 
Senator Reed and I have talked about this. We're going to have six-minute rounds as opposed to the normal five-minute rounds. There are a lot of things uh, that we want to discuss, but I'm concerned about one thing uh, more than the rest that affect you, uh, Admiral Moran, and that is this whole lead ship uh, concept. You and I talked about it in my office. We have uh, looked at this for a long period of time. I can remember when we did the NDAA back in uh, 2017. We addressed this. In fact, just reading one, one of the requirements says, you don't deliver a covered vessel until the Navy determines that the vessel is assembled and complete. That just hasn't been happening. It's just uh, not your fault. I mean, you, you weren't in on that deal, but so, so resolving the problem is something uh, we're going to ask you to be, uh, to be addressing. The last eight combatant lead ships cost a total of $8 billion more than the initial budget. Uh, five were delivered at least two years late with do dozens of deficiencies. Uh, the example that I like to use, because I was down there and I have seen it, the Ford class was delivered. It was supposed to be delivered in 2015. It was finally delivered in 2017 at a, uh, a cost of an additional two and a half billion dollars over the budget, and the weapons elevators still don't work. There's also other problems with it, uh, but those are the things that, you know, obviously, unless you deliver the ordinances, you're not going to be able to do anything with that. So, what I'd like to have you just briefly. Um, do you, does anything come to your mind right now as to a change that could take place that could change our lead system concept? Senator, thank, thanks for the question. I, several things come to mind immediately, and one is in order to be effective at building new programs, uh, new capabilities, is we've got to set the requirements early, and we've got to hold to those requirements and only make adjustments when absolutely necessary. We've got to make sure that we don't add risk to a program with layers of new capabilities, new technology that haven't been proven or prototyped yet. And I think uh, if we get those right, it will reduce what you describe at the yeah, front end. Yeah, you see, I think you brought out something that's significant here, because it's not all the fault of a contractor out there. We, we change the rules, change the criteria, and uh, it's just that this system hasn't been working. So I think you're right on target on uh, an approach, and we'll be following your progress as it takes place. Uh, General Berger, we, um, you know, we've gone through a period, well, first of all, let me compliment you. We, I had a team over there in the, in the South China Sea. We started off in Hawaii, and uh, I, I'm not the only one at this table up here that doesn't like PowerPoints. Uh, and what you did instead of a PowerPoint was something brand new. You had maps in front of you, and you kind of walked us through. And, uh, and, and that was, so uh, you teach somebody else how to do that too, will you? <laughs> the, uh, now, the, we know what happened during the, the last administration. The priorities were not on, we had, uh, our brigade combat teams, only about 30% of them could be deployed. Same thing with our Army Aviation Brigades. Uh, I think that's 35%. Our, uh, our F-18s uh, that we use, they're in the Marines. We only had 40% of those that would actually could actually be used in combat at that time. And we saw this taking place. The general public was not aware of this, but we were at this table aware of it. Now we have, um, uh, they were down to 40% on the F-18s. I'd like to, and I, I think the Secretary of Defense has talked about 80% as an expectation. Where are we now? We've done some improvements in the last two years. Uh, where are we on that? Uh, Senator, the 80 percent uh, goal set by the Secretary of Defense was for all the services, and we've all been working hard to get there. Uh, I think first, uh, I'll, I'll say up front, we would not be where we are right now in terms of readiness in TAC Air or anywhere else without the uh, support of Congress and the oversight that you provided to make sure we were spending it on readiness, and it's happened. It's, it's, we're not where we need to be yet, but we're on the right path. Yeah, give me a percentage. On the F-18s uh, and the F-35s together for the Marine Corps, the goal is 80 percent. Last week, F-18s uh, hit 80 percent. F-35s hit about 74 percent. Hmm. So I think uh, both the Navy and the Marine Corps are paying close attention to it. Um, there's things out of our control uh, that we can't, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, but I think the path that we're on 
uh, should make it uh, doable later this year to reach 80 percent. Okay. Well, that's, you know, that's a better answer than I would anticipate in this short period of time. But we also know that there's movement within that. So it's going to go up and down and not maintain a percentage. And I understand that. The, um, a lot of systems right now, the Air Force is going through replacing the uh, KC-135 with the KC-46 and uh, after many, many years. The uh, CH-53 uh, Echoes uh, came, uh, came around in, I think it's 1981, and now we're looking at dramatic improvements, and although the cost had looked, uh, has come in anticipating to be pretty high. Uh, would you comment on this uh, moving to the uh, to the CH-53 Kilo model and why? Sir, so just a, a couple quick thoughts there to answer the question. The 53K, um, uh, first of all, the program has been restructured based on the testing that was uh, done over the past 18 months by the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Gertz, and the vendor, Lockheed Martin. So that has been re restructured, the program, uh, and thanks to this committee and Congress for authorizing a reprogramming of funds to make sure that the testing could continue. I'm confident that that aircraft will meet our requirements and the requirements remain valid. It will, do, it will be the heaviest lift helicopter we own in the U.S. military. It has greater range, greater speed, greater reliability than the 53 Echo, which you mentioned is uh, approaching 30 years right now. I'm confident that the oversight means are, are in place and, and uh, the, both the uh, uh, Secretary Gertz and the Marine Corps leaders are watching it closely. But that's an aircraft that can do what no other aircraft can. We need it. Yeah, and we know, we, we hear the costs on this, but initially we understand that the costs are going to be higher. Uh, and I am concerned about that when you just look at it and you say $100 million for a, uh, for a helicopter when Right now, we're at about $80 million for a strike vehicle. So uh, we, wanna, we want to follow that real closely, which we will be doing. Thank you very much. Senator Reed. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Moran, um, in 2017, the Navy suffered two horrendous accidents, the collisions involving the USS Fitzgerald and the USS John S. McCain. And there were significant investigations following through. What did you learn from this investigation, and how have you made these, uh, how have you tried to inculcate the lessons learned into the fleet? Yes, Senator, uh, first of all, my heart continues to go out to the families of those sailors who we lost. Uh, secondly, as you know, we underwent uh, two significant reviews, one that was done by Admiral Davidson at the time, a comprehensive review that looked at the entire fleet with a focus on 7th Fleet where the collisions occurred, and then a strategic readiness review which was commissioned by the Secretary of the Navy to look at the broader cultural aspects and uh, other pressures that may have contributed to, uh, to the collisions. Uh, out of those two reports, along with GAO recommendations, the investigations themselves from the two collisions, and our own IG, we, we brought forward about uh, 111 recommendations uh, to go after uh, areas that the, all of those investigating bodies looked at and said we needed to make improvements on. Uh, we immediately stood up. Uh, through the TICOM, which is in this case Vice Admiral Brown out in San Diego, to make sure that first and foremost we took a look at the recommendations that addressed safe operations of the fleet. Those were implemented quite early on, but followed up by Admiral Brown when he took over in January of 2018. Uh, after that, we went after those, those recommendations that looked at effective operations and that's the bulk of the, uh, the recommendations that go into these, these reports. Uh, we are well down the path, and by the end of this, this year, we will have implemented all of those recommendations. Uh, and I say implemented with a cautionary note in that we are not calling them complete because we think we need two or three years of runtime and reevaluating and getting feedback to make sure that the recommendations as implemented are being effective uh, to uh, to drive safe, effective operations and change the culture uh, of our fleet, to, to be more willing to uh, ask for 
help when needed, um, ask for relief when needed, and give the COs more time back to train their individual crews. Uh, have any of these changes uh, or the incidents themselves affected recruiting and retention? No, sir. As a matter of fact, uh, retention in 7th Fleet right now is about 30 percent higher than the rest of the fleet. So uh, just as an example, I think we've addressed a lot of the problems. We are, we've still got a long way to go. Uh, there are examples of where we, uh, we've implemented something like fatigue management. Um, and at, while everybody's complying with the, reg, uh, with the direction, I'm not sure they're as effective as they need to be, and we're going to continue to go after that. Thank you. Uh, for both uh, Admiral Moran and General Byrd, the Secretary of the Navy submitted a top ten list. This is not the top ten list you want of Marine Corps and Navy installations that are most vulnerable to severe weather. And do you believe that uh, we should adopt, i.e., the Department of the Navy and the Marine Corps, uh, better installation resiliency planning and guidance as a result of uh, weather threats? Madam Moran? Sir, there is no question that we need, uh, and we are developing a plan for greater resiliency, especially in areas where we have shipyards and communities that share water space, share waterfront. Um, those are really important areas for us for obvious reasons. And uh, we are largely a waterfront service, so uh, climate change, when, when there's rising waters, are going to be a problem for us if, uh, if we don't address them. So we are in the planning stages to look at how to reinforce uh, those areas. And General Berger. Uh, I'd agree, sir. The two biggest challenges are the rising water levels and severe storms uh, that roll up the coast uh, and through our bases and stations. I think the, the new standards for construction, for military construction, are absolutely critical. When we uh, recover from a storm like we are now in North Carolina, we need to look at the location of the buildings. We need to look at the construction <laughs> standards of the buildings to make sure that uh, they'll survive, uh, you know, what the climate is going to throw at them. But absolutely, it's, uh, it's an important factor for us. And the, the standards for construction are very helpful. And following up to, in a more general way with uh, the chairman's question about acquisition programs, um, over the last several years, the NDAA uh, has given the services more opportunity to participate in acquisition. Uh, can you give us a sense of whether we're headed in the right direction? What's the, the dynamic between the uh, secretary or undersecretary, rather, of defense for acquisition in terms of the service chiefs? And start with you, Admiral Moran. I only have brief time, so you yes, can be brief. Senator, uh, the, I think we have all the authorities we need. Uh, as a result of the work of this body, and uh, we appreciate that. And uh, if confirmed, I will actively participate in all the programs to make sure that we get requirements right uh, and that we can deliver on time. General Berger. I'd echo that, sir. And having gone through the process for the first time this, uh, this winter time, reviewing each major acquisition program together with the Navy and Secretary Gertz, it's a very deliberate process, and I saw the service chief has a mechanism to weigh in on the health of the program. It's Thank very you. good. The, uh, one uh, just final point very quickly is that one of the things that's impressed me more and more is it not just the cost of the platform, but the sustainment cost of the platforms going forward. I think most Americans would be uh, uh, startled if they realized that the sustainment costs are an hour of flight of an F-35 is $34,000. So that's a little bit more than I think most Americans on the street would assume was a, a cost to keep an aircraft aloft. But thank you, gentlemen, both for your service. Thank you. thank you, Senator Reed. Senator Wicker. Mr. Chairman, these are two outstanding nominees. It's great to hear from them today. Uh, I want to ask about um, um, proc ship procurement. Um, Congress authorized and appropriated $350 million each for the LHA-9 and LPD-31 in FY19. We provided these funds to accelerate construction of these two ships and to pay critical suppliers long lead time material that's needed in some cases 150 weeks before construction. Um, General Berger, I've heard um, you say today that uh, with the leadership of people like General Neller, we've largely recovered from some of the cuts we had to sustain. You mentioned uh, first, to fight being the, uh, the role of the Marines' uh, decisive power. 
Um, and yet, um, the, the, the recent OMB budget um, removed amphibious ship production from the FY20 budget proposal. Um, um, the proposal w w would be to uh, put the LPD procurement in uh, 2021, LHA procurement in 2024. Um, when it comes to first to fight and de decisive power, uh, General, can you explain to the committee in this unclassified setting how uh, an LHA with an F-35B squadron or an LPD with high mobility artillery rocket system um, expands the effectiveness and utility of the U.S. amphibious forces. I think we have the flexibility um, and, uh, and we have the capability and smarts to find a way to move money around and go ahead and stick with the plan that we enacted last year. Sir, it's, it's going to sound a bit parochial, but uh, I don't believe there's any more versatile capability than an Embark Marine Force on an amphibious ship. And our requirement, as agreed to by the Department of the Navy, is 38 amphib ships. That's the current amphibious ship requirement. 12 big decks and 26 LPDs and LSDs, or LPD Flight 2s. And I might interject, that's the opinion of General Dunford. Secretary Spencer and Secretary Gertz. Correct, sir. And uh, to answer your uh, latter part of your question, Senator, um, what those four deployed Naval Expeditionary Forces, for example, F-35s on a big deck do, they are, <clears throat> I don't know of a more effective deterrent. There probably are equals, but I don't know of a more effective one. And uh, as far as a contact force forward, that gives you the capability to present a deterrence force, and if, if, the, if the adversary chooses not to comply, then you can, you can turn offensive very quickly. Do you think we have the flexibility of the DOD budget to ensure that LPD and LHA procurement programs remain on track and that no funds from either LPD or LHA procurement uh, can be um, taken for other purposes? All I can... Uh, tell you, Senators, from the Marine Corps' perspective, I know what the requirement is. And I also know that the Secretary uh, ha and the CNO have a larger portfolio of requirements. Ships are part of that. So the best I can do as Service Chief, if confirmed, I think, is make sure the Secretary, the CNO, understand what the Marine Corps needs, and then uh, have part have the discussion about the greater needs of the Department of the Navy. Okay, let me ask, uh, I, I appreciate that emphatic statement, and I think that's helpful to the committee. Let me ask both of you then, and I'll begin with you, General. Um, and the, the chairman alluded to this, the, the time we, uh, during uh, the previous eight years, we had to deal with sequestration and continuing resolutions. What would be the effect this year on the requirements that we have and your ability to uh, be first to fight and, and uh, deliver lethality if, um, we had to deal with um, a continuing resolution at the end of this fiscal year, or, uh, or even worse, go back to sequestration, which is in the statute today. Unless we change the statute, we're back at sequestration. And we got a minute and a half. I'll, I'll uh, start with you, General Berger, and then go with you, Admiral. Sir, and I'll be brief. Uh, if it's a continuing resolution, based on my experience, um, commanders below us have to uh, make hard decisions on what's in their training plan, and they'll have to probably delay some of those or cancel them. Procurements are going to be delayed. New starts you cannot do under a continuing resolution. And the worst part about it for us is the unpredictability. You don't know how many or how long the continuing resolution will last. So at best, you try to hold your head above water with what you've got. But what really happens is an erosion of readiness and in jeopardy is procurement. If it's a BCA, sir, and very quickly, it's even more catastrophic. And Admiral Moran. Yeah, Senator, all I'll, uh, to add to what General Berger articulated there, I would have, uh, uh, I'll, I'll definitely uh, pile on with the stability uh, of an, a capital intensive force like the United States Navy and the Marine Corps is uh, with, with large contracts on 
large ships and submarines and aircraft uh, it really affects our vendor base, really affects industry. They need stability, they need predictability to be efficient, to hire appropriately, and then to be able to maintain our equipment is also affected by CRs and most certainly under a BCA. And, and that absolutely affects the recovery that the general was giving General Neller credit for, um, uh, for largely uh, um, uh, affecting. Yes, sir, that's correct. Just if I could add just uh, one final thought, sir. What would happen is the, especially in the Naval Service, we would, we would make sure the next deploying forces are ready to go. And we would triage everything else in the service to make sure they're ready to go. But readiness in the rest of the fleet, non-deploying, would start to fall off. Thank you, sir. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Wicker. Senator Shaheen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Admiral Moran, General Berger, thank you both for your service and congratulations on your nominations. I would just like to add, before I go into my questions, add my concerns to Senator Wickers about going back to a situation, as you both described, that would put us where we were before the last couple of years when we were able to get some budget certainty. I think that would be a disaster for our men and women serving, and it's important for this committee and this Congress to provide leadership and to get agreement so that we can move forward with a budget that people can count on. Um, Admiral Moran, I was encouraged by a recent memo that was drafted by Acting Secretary of Defense Shanahan that directs the MILCON projects with fiscal year 2019 award dates to be exempt from having their funding diverted to pay for a border wall. Um, I know you've been to the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. You've had a chance, um, I've had a chance to be there with you as we looked at those three projects that had to do with expansion of the dry dock capacity that are there. Can you talk about why it's so important for us to be able to expand our dry dock to pass capacity to be able to maintain um, the submarines, the attack submarines that are so important to our Navy? Senator, I can, and uh, my... Uh my compliments to Portsmouth. They do a fabulous job on our nuclear submarines up there. It's a vital uh, base for us in terms of recovering uh, from a, a very significant issue with our submarine force and getting maintenance done on time. As you know, the SSN force takes uh, third priority against the, uh, the uh, ballistic missile uh, submarine force and the carriers. So when the public yards that do a lot of our work uh, get backed up by some of that work, um, the, the SSN force is, uh, is suffering from that. And we're seeing that today, the effects of that. Uh, the, the work and the projects to expand the dry docks in, in Portsmouth and other places are really important because we're, we're now starting to see Virginia's come in where mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a ship that has a different requirement in those dry docks. Uh, so not only is it to, uh, to address <coughs> the uh, Virginia class, but it's also to address the shortfall in capacity that we're seeing around the fleet in our public yards. So much so that we've expanded into some of the private yards to do some of this work just out of need. Thank you. Um, I agree. Any delay in getting those projects uh, going is going to have an impact on our ability to maintain the submarines we need. General Berger, in his opening statement, Chairman uh, Enhoff talked about the challenge of balancing our operations in Afghanistan and Iraq with the competition we are facing from China and Russia. As I think I said to you when we met, I joined Senator Reid and Senator Jones on a trip to Iraq and Afghanistan over the last two weeks and saw um, firsthand the impressive work that's still going on there by our men and women who are serving and what they're doing to keep ISIS from coming back in Iraq to continue to combat the threat of al-Qaeda and the Taliban in Afghanistan. But can you talk about the challenges that it presents for us to have those continuing operations when we're trying to ramp up to address what's happening with Russia and China? The uh, rotation of forces that you were um, fortunate enough to visit is on a regular basis and they go through a pre-deployment training program, ma'am, that's uh, deliberate, and it's focused on the assigned mission that they're going to have there, which isn't necessarily their core mission, but it's 
what they'll have to do while deployed. Um, many of the skill sets are uh, transferable. Some are unique, as, you, as you're uh, alluding to. Uh, overall, uh, we balance the force based on the maritime deployment requirements as amphibious ready groups and marine expeditionary units against uh, the requirement to uh, fulfill all our commitment in the Middle East. Uh, I'm confident the units that go there, and I know who they are, are well trained. I'm also confident that when they return, uh, they'll get right to work on the skill sets that atrophied because of their focus, mm -hmm. unique focus on a, on a counterterrorism mission. Thank you. Um, you both talked about the challenges of addressing the changes that are happening because of our climate. And I think you referenced General Berger construction standards. As you both are looking at um, the construction standards, the need to have a plan that's more resilient that addresses um, how to respond to these storms in the future. Are you also looking at efficiency as part of any rebuilding or the efforts that are going on to respond to climate? Yes, ma'am. I'll start. We have some efforts going on uh, in, on the energy front alone to try to reduce the, the uh, reliance on current en energy levels. So those efforts, uh, unfortunately, are first to fall off when we get challenged on the MILCON side or, or reprogramming side. Uh, but it is we continue to plan for that uh, so that we're more effective at our installations to include the yards. And can you also talk about the cost benefit of that? Well, certainly cost benefit to reducing energy uh, requirements. Yes, ma'am. General Berger. Uh, I didn't know much about that aspect of our bases and stations, frankly, till I was at 29 Palms. And when you're a base commander and you look at the energy bill, you get smart on that real fast. The standards written into them, as the Admiral said, are now part of the, part of the design. And uh, the lead, the silver, gold, the, the ranking system is very effective. And the return on, on investment for the base commander is huge if he, if he monitors it closely. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Senator Sheehan. Senator Cotton. Gentlemen, thank you both for your service to our nation and for being willing to answer the call to serve once again. Thank you in particular to your wonderful spouses and all they've done to enable your service and the example they've set for our military spouses in both the Navy and the Marine Corps. Um, Admiral Moran, I want to talk a little bit about the Truman. Um, we've already explored this with Secretary Spencer and Admiral Richardson, but the budget request obviously uh, proposes not to conduct the midlife refueling of the Truman. So that means that we'll be down a carrier for about 25 years um, up until I think the late 2040s until we build that out. So that gets us below our requirement of 12 carriers. Um, I just want to get your thoughts on this decision and the extent to which it affects reflects some new strategic thinking about the way we fight joint war to the extent it reflects the constrained uh, budget that the Navy has had for several years because of the Congress. Senator, I think you captured both of them in your question. Uh, there, there is a strategic shift in, in how we are approaching the way we fight, and it's called distributed maritime operations. In, in a nutshell, in a simple way, th think about just spreading the offense out over a greater playing field. Uh, in order to be to have multiple attack threat vectors to adversaries that would want to challenge us as, at sea. Uh, so to do that, we believe we're going to need to modernize our force in a way that we haven't thought of in the past, especially in the unmanned arena. Uh, we certainly have seen the benefit of, un, of unmanned aviation over the last 17 years of combat. Um, we, we clearly believe that unmanned undersea and undermanned surface will it help us expand those threat vectors in the future at a lower cost because of uh, the, the requirement not to man them. Uh, so in order to do that, we, we needed to find money because we felt like we needed to move this time around on this budget. Uh, we needed to go find the money to be able to do modernization, experimentation, prototyping, R&D for the things that we should be delivering uh, in the next five to 10 years. Uh, Truman is a, is a big bill in the FITUP, and uh, by looking at that as a way to offset these, these requirements and, and investments that we wanted to make, uh, that's, that's where this decision came from. Congress may not be good at many things, but one thing it is good at is finding money. 
uh, it, if the Congress found money to both refuel the Truman and continue on the new Ford class carrier program, I assume that's not something the Navy would decline. Is that correct? No, well, sir, we, we wouldn't decline more money, but uh, uh, to the earlier question about CR and sequestration, uh, we, we have a mindful eye that that's on the horizon. And even if you added money, I think we would have to be very careful about how that money was allocated. Well, I, that's a bigger question. I hope we don't get there, but we will burn that bridge when we get to it. Yes, sir. Um, I want to talk to you both of you about pilot retention. This is an issue on which I have focused uh, in the Air Force. Uh, we've seen some of the same issues in the Navy and the Marine Corps now. I'd just like to hear from you what we're doing to retain these pilots after we spend so much time and money in training them. Uh, General Berger, you want to start with Marine Corps efforts? Uh, on the front end, uh, Senator, recruiting uh, always has been a focus. I think now uh, even more so, not, not specifically the numbers, but more uh, looking to, we may lengthen the time of service that their, their initial obligation is so that we can train and then get the benefit on the back end because they're, like you mentioned, their pipeline for training is, is longer than it was 10 years ago. On the retention side, very targeted bonuses, incentives for them to stay. I think uh, there is no question w uh, within the Marine Corps, we know the competition uh, from the airlines is, is, is here now and it's not gonna go away in a year. The third part though, uh, Senators, the readiness improvement in our platforms uh, is critical in retention because Pilots come in to fly, and if we can't give them but six or seven or eight hours a month, uh, after a while, that gets really frustrating. The recovered readiness, in other words, on our aviation platforms is huge. The more they fly, the happier they are, better we are as a service. So we have to, we have to keep readiness high. It's directly related to retention. Senator, I completely agree with uh, General Berger, on, especially on the last point. Uh, there's nothing more disincentivizing to an aviator than not being able to fly. Uh, and it's more than that. It's, it's having to go through two or three airplanes on a pre-flight just to get one that will fly. And that's where we were uh, several years ago. And thanks to this Congress and the RAA in 17 and the continued funding steady stream, we've been able to recover there in many areas. We've still got a ways to go, uh, but that is the number one disincentive uh, for, for our aviators from all platforms, all type model series, uh, but all of the other avenues that uh, General Berger related to in terms of bonus authority, recruiting, uh, those sorts of things are, uh, are being actively pursued and we've, had, we've got plenty of authority from Congress to be able to execute that. Good, I'm glad to hear that. This is actually one case where I think throwing a lot of money at the problem won't make a difference. Um, those bonuses are nice. Uh, we should reward our service members, especially in the most skilled positions. But General Berger, as you said, you're never gonna be able to pay as much money as an airline. And your young pilots joined the Marine Corps and the Navy to fly high performance aircraft against bad guys in defense of our nation, not to make a little bit more, more, more money, even though that's welcome. And I bet Lieutenant Moran might not have stuck around to be Admiral Moran if he only got four or five hours of flight time a month and was only spending the rest of his time making PowerPoint slides. So I'm glad to hear that you recognize, recognize that part of making sure that we retain the world's best pilots in the Navy and the Marine Corps. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Senator Cotton. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to join in thanking you both for your extraordinary service and your families. General Berger, when we talked about the Marine Corps Special Operations Command, MARSOC, at one of the subcommittee meetings. Uh, you indicated that you wholeheartedly support this national asset, and in fact, it is developing, as you said, quote, further and faster than most thought possible, uh, end quote. I assume that MARSOC will continue to be a priority of yours as Commandant. That's correct, Senator, it will. And do you agree with General Neller that much of what your service does in the future will not be against a near peer adversary uh, and uh, that, as you say, the Marine Corps must be versatile and nimble in responding to challenges of battles as an expeditionary force? Uh, as I mentioned in the opening, Senator, my uh, 
my experience is we won't forecast, we won't predict what the next crisis is. And I think you require our Naval Service to be ready to operate against any threat anywhere across the range, from a non-combatant evacuation or a typhoon recovery all the way to the high end. We don't have the luxury of picking a single uh, threat and train it against it. We know what our peer pacing one is, but we have to be ready to operate across the spectrum. Thank you. Admiral Moran, uh, you stated in uh, your advanced policy questions that one of your priorities is going to be hypersonics, which raises a larger strategic question about our naval assets. We now invest in carrier strike groups and amphibious ready groups that are built around a very limited number of extraordinarily costly and difficult to replace ships. My concern is that hypersonics and other advancing means of warfare make them more and more vulnerable. We are investing in naval assets in immense amounts that uh, still are very susceptible to attack. Uh, the current budget in uh, this year, this year's request includes 2.6 billion for funding the hypersonics programs. Uh, the, import, the American people have little or no understanding of the dangers involved in the hypersonic glide missile that, for example, the Russians are yeah. developing, that they can attach to an intercontinental ballistic missile to achieve highly maneuverable delivery mechanisms that, again, place at great risk our assets at sea. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about whether the Navy is reevaluating and reconsidering this strategic approach. We're building two more carriers. Uh, one of my colleagues, Senator Cotton, just questioned about the Truman. Um, I'm wondering whether we don't need to have a complete reconsideration of our strategic investments in light of these increasingly frightening threats to our naval assets. Senator, thanks for the question. The uh, couple things. First, we're, we're in the midst of a 2019 force structure assessment will be done near the end of this year. Uh, that will be informed by current and future threats. It will be informed on demand. It will be informed by the national defense strategy. Uh, and it will be informed by the capability roadmaps that we have in play now and which we're forecasting to bring in the future. So I think uh, we're, we're going to wait to see what that force structure assessment says about the mix of platforms that we think we're going to need to be able to fight in the future. Uh, so I'm, I promise to you, commit to you, that I'll bring that, the results of those, uh, of that force structure assessment back to this body uh, if confirmed. But some of our investment in those platforms is already well underway. Yes, sir. And some of it may be rendered, I won't say useless, but at least requiring reevaluation by the assessment that you're doing right now. Yes, sir. Senator, we, we have for years evaluated the threats to the aircraft carrier and our other ships in our strike groups uh, to, to be able to deal with those. So I think you would agree that our engineers in our labs are remarkable at finding solutions to some of these problems and challenges that come before us. Uh, the aircraft carrier, as Admiral Davidson stated in his testimony, and the CNO and the Secretary have both um, testified to is the most survivable airfield that we have today, anywhere. Uh, and we project it will be that way well into the future. Uh, there's a highly classified brief that I would enjoy bringing that to you and other members of this committee so that you can see the kind of investments that we are making in protecting the survivability of the aircraft carrier. I think that, that brief, and uh, I welcome your suggesting it, would be not only valuable, but absolutely essential to us. But equally so, we need to share some of this information with the American people. Everything that I've mentioned today, and I can't go much more into detail, is publicly available. 
but the vast majority of knowledge that we have about what the Russians are developing and perhaps other powers is classified. And so they know what they're developing. We know what they're developing. They know we know what they're developing. The ones in the deepest dark are the American people, yes, sir. and they need to understand it. Yes, sir. We so, owe you a better narrative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Rounds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And gentlemen, first of all, thank you both for your service to our country and to your families for the sacrifice that they also uh, offer. Uh, Admiral Moran, I most certainly appreciated the phone call that we had the other day concerning a couple of items. First of all, with regard to the, um, the situation today with nuclear attack submarines, Senator Shaheen brought the issue up once again, and I, I just want to do a follow-up with you on that. Um, the USS Boise, as an example, uh, has been tied up and is now moving into dry dock, I believe, but it, we're talking about a six-year period of time minimum for the refueling. You've got three other nuclear attack submarines that are in a similar situation that are still waiting. That doesn't say much with regards to how, even if we have a 355-ship Navy in the future, how we're going to be able to maintain them. Uh, is there a long-term plan to address uh, uh, the challenge of the, the facilities needed to actually maintain a 355-ship Navy in the future? Sir, the, there is a plan. It's called the uh, Shipyard Optimization Plan. It's a $21 billion effort over 20 years. It goes after several efficiencies in, in our public yards. Uh, we are, of course, encouraging our private shipyard uh, maintainers uh, to also invest in their own capacity uh, because we are doing some of that nuclear work in private yards today. And so that Com combination of public and private uh, partnership here when it comes to our shipyards is going to be vital into the future. Uh, you're absolutely right on uh, the, the SSN backlog that exists. Earlier, uh, we talked about uh, the prioritization of nuclear maintenance is with our SSBN force and our carrier force and then SSNs. So we have to fix the front end first. And the good news is we are starting to see some progress here and important progress on our, on our SSBN force and our carrier force. We've had a couple carriers actually on the West Coast come out early from their availabilities. That's a first in a long time. That's important. But we've got a ways to go on the East Coast, and, and there's some efforts going underway there. I think part of what the, the question is is recognizing that there's a plan in place. My, my question really is do we have the resources to execute the plan, or is it a plan which is simply on the shelf and it needs to be implemented. Well, sir, the, the plan is, is in the budget. Uh, it is funded to the ship, shipyard optimization plan. Uh, and we, and of course, we're anxious about uh, where 20 will land at the end of the day and whether we can continue on that. that and, effort. and so what you're telling us is, is that if we don't stick to the budget plan that we've got, uh, with the appropriation plan that we've got, if we revert back, Basically, we have assets out there that would not be serviceable in the future that we need and that would otherwise be a waste of taxpayer money if we're not able to get them serviced and back into operation again. Yes, sir. The momentum we've started here in the last couple of years, thanks to this body um, and the additional money for readiness, uh, will be lost if we go into an extended CR or sequestration levels uh, next January. No question. The F-35Cs uh, um, that right now we're implementing, and I know that there's been a discussion about fourth gen and fifth gen and the right mix and so forth, but I think anybody would suggest that if we could get fifth gen in place, we'd prefer to have more fifth gen rather than new fourth gen fighters. Is that a fair assessment? It's a balanced discussion, Senator. Uh, we've got a lot of invested investment in our Super Hornet fleet. We've got new capability coming out with that aircraft. And the way we operate off the aircraft carrier in the air wing component, uh, it allows for a 50, 50, fifth, fourth gen mix. Uh, and that's the program we're headed for. We think that's the right balance for the carrier aviation side. And when you combine that with what our partners in the Marine Corps can bring, it's a pretty powerful uh, capability. Thank you. Finally, just want to touch base on cyber for just a minute. Uh, 
Um, I was impressed with the fact that uh, the Navy came out with a report uh, laying out their current challenges with cyber. Uh, there was some criticism uh, of just how direct it was, but I found it rather refreshing that the Navy would actually lay out what I think every single branch has for challenges with regard to cyber and in working with their, their, their uh, contractors and so forth. Um, where are we at with regards to the, to the implementation of the changes that have been recommendation within that Blue Ribbon report? Yes, sir, uh, it, it's a very important report on an incredibly important topic. Uh, and there's, there's multiple layers of that report. There's the unclass version that has been provided here, and, and there's also a higher level classification that uh, dives a little deeper into that, which I think if you haven't received a copy, I'll make sure you do get one. Uh, the, I think what, it's, uh, what the Undersecretary and the Secretary have done is brought on one of the authors of that report to help us navigate our way through building a plan to, to go after the specific recommendations that were made in that report uh, to, to reinforce uh, our security posture for cyber and uh, also take a look at other capabilities that are resident within our cyber domain. Well, thank you. And I just, once again, I think it was refreshing that the Navy took the lead. And I know that there were some recommendations that would be coordinated, not just within the Navy, but others within the Department of Defense, and that there may be some additional positions that are being asked for that the other departments may, other, may otherwise need in order to coordinate effectively the, uh, the cyber protection systems that need to be in place, not just in the Navy, but, but across DOD. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Senator Chairman. Rain, uh, Senator uh, Browns, Senator Kane. Mr. Chair, might I swap places with Senator King to accommodate him to get to another hearing? Oh, that's Thank acceptable. You. Thank you, Senator. Uh, <clears throat> Title 10, Section 151B, the functions of the Joint Chiefs. The first thing that's listed is military advisor to the President. That's the function of the Chairman, but it also is the function of the members. I think that's your most important job. Will you commit to this committee and to me that in this position you will provide your best unvarnished, truthful advice based on your deep military experience to the President of the United States, to the National Security Council in all situations involving the possible use of military force? Admiral Moran. No question, Senator. General. Yes, sir. I, I have one bit of homework, although I suspect you've already done it. Uh, I think anybody entering a position of, uh, that you're entering should read H.R. McMaster's book, Dereliction of Duty. Uh, it is a classic study of a failure of policy uh, during the Vietnam era, and it focuses very specifically on the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So I, I just, I, I can't emphasize enough how important this is, uh, and, and your terms are four years, so you'll certainly be advising this president for two years, perhaps for four years, or perhaps another president. So this isn't president specific, but I'm just suggesting that, that your absolutely truthful uh, advice, again, based on both of your ex extraordinary careers, is what the country needs and demands, and I appreciate your commitment to that. Um, Admiral Moran, uh, you, you started off, I think it was uh, uh, Senator Reed who asked about the Fitzgerald of the McCain, and you know that I've had a, a deep interest in that. You indicated that you're satisfied that the, the, the steps are being taken, the progress is being made. I want to be a little more specific. Are, are, do you have the metrics? Do you have the measurements? Do you believe that, for example, staffing, training, uh, that, that this, we're not, I don't want to take assurances from a captain or from somebody in the, in the middle of the chain of command. Do you have confidence that the changes that are necessary to avoid tragedies like that have actually, are actually underway? Oh, absolutely, and uh, happy to. I know you've asked for those metrics on a quarterly basis, and I will commit to you that you will get them. Thank you, uh, Admiral. You you were uh, you were in the personnel business for a while, as I recall, and we talked about this. Sure. And one of the issues that you raised at that time was the narrowing of the base of the military, of the volunteer military. I think you said something like 84 percent of the people in active duty today come from military bloodlines. There also is a regionalization of the military. There are no active duty military bases in the Northeast, for example. I worry about the separation of the military from the remainder of the society. Is this something you think that we need to, to address? 
I, th I think it should always concern us that, that, that the, uh, the narrow slice of America that's participating in the defense of the country uh, continues. We, we need to expand that. Uh, and that's to take nothing away from the military bloodlines, the young men and women who come in. They're, they're incredible. Uh, but we do need for the rest of America to participate in this. So we've got to reach out more. Uh, and we're doing that through several different means. Uh, a lot of it's being done virtually because that's how we reach young men and women today to at least start the process. That's having an impact uh, on this regionalization discussion you talked about. But we've got so much more to do on this. General, do you have thoughts on this subject? I think, uh, Senator, the most visible uh, symbols of the military around the, the U.S., in my opinion, are reservists and their reserve units and recruiters, frankly. Those are the ones that are the most visible. Um, but uh, to your point, the service has an obligation to actively communicate with the public. Now, th those are visible presence out in the communities, but we have an obligation to communicate with the people about what their taxpayers' dollars are getting for their defense and why what we're doing is so important. I don't think that's something we can ever take for granted, in other words. We have to do that proactively, and it has to be part of our jobs. And, and I appreciate that, and I think broadening your reach in terms of recruitment, uh, we, the citizen soldier is a part of the history of this country, and it would be a shame. I, 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 I do, my worry is that the military is over here, and the public doesn't have that much connection with what it is you do, what your values are. So I commend you for those efforts and hope, it, and I think you said, Admiral, active measures. This, this isn't going to happen by itself. Uh, finally, Admiral, a, a plea. Uh, we've had testimony in this committee over the last several years about drug shipments coming into the United States via the, via the water, via the ocean, and that we only have the assets, the ships, to interdict 25 percent of the shipments we know of. And I would, uh, I would urge you to work with the secretary, to work with the, the staff, to devote greater assets. And they don't have to be big destroyers or aircraft carriers. They can be frigates and smaller vessels uh, to work on this horrendous problem, which is killing Americans every day. Since this hearing started, uh, about six Americans have died of overdoses just in the last two hours. So uh, I, I hope that this is something you can look at. It's not, you know, it's not China and it's not Russia and it's not anti-submarine warfare, but it is deadly and a deadly attack on this country that we can do something about simply by the allocation of sufficient assets. Yes, is that something you're willing to uh, uh, absolutely. look at? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator King. Uh, Senator Ernst. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and gentlemen. Thank you very much for stepping forward and taking on, hopefully, additional levels of authority. I want to thank your family and friends for being here today as well. Welcome to all of you. Um, gentlemen, both of you have talked a little bit about emerging threats and want to do a, a little deeper dive there. Um, Admiral Moran, you stated that if confirmed, you do intend to continue the Navy on a path forward towards a more agile, sustainable, and capable naval force to meet new and emerging threats. And General Berger, you stated that if you are confirmed, your goal would be not merely to meet new and emerging threats, but to maintain a margin of overmatch over potential adversaries. So, gentlemen, if you would each um, maybe describe what you believe to be uh, the, the most threatening emerging um, adversary or, or capability that might be out there, and then how do we compete, and General Berger, or Berger to your, uh, your words, how do we overmatch in those areas? Admiral Moran, if we could start with you, please. Yeah, Senator, we, we quickly go classified on, on capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, love to come back and talk to you at a, in a different setting on specifics. Uh, but I think it already mentioned uh, some of the high technology uh, efforts that are underway across the globe on hypersonics, lasers, um, and, and to a large extent, this issue of cybersecurity uh, and our ability to communicate with uh, authoritative information so that we mm -hmm. can make decisions uh, that are clear and and compelling. So uh, there are several areas that uh, that we want to maintain our asymmetric advantage. For us, we believe the 
uh, undersea is where we have a significant advantage and we need to continue to pace that so that uh, others don't catch up. Part of that's capacity. Uh, as you know, we're, we're well below our requirement of 66 SSNs. Uh, the path right. to get re to recover is not a fast path. It's limited by industrial capacity. It's in, limited by workforce capacity. So those, those things uh, will be uh, front and center as we take the Navy forward into the future, among many other aspects of the future air wing, how it looks, and uh, the kinds of capabilities we're going to be able to bring to be able to reach the adversary at greater range so that we don't put our forces at unnecessary risk, partner with our joint forces to be able to deliver from multiple different attack vectors. And I think that's what I'm most excited about working with General Berger on is developing those CONOPs into the future so that this team, at least, is able to, to answer the nation's call when it comes. Outstanding. Thank you, sir. Uh, General Berger. I think uh, Senator well-documented, uh, well, uh, well-covered is the fact that both Russia and China watched us pretty closely over the last 15 years, um, modernized, and uh, frankly focused against a single adversary, us, mm -hmm. for a decade and a half or more. And when you can do that and you don't have global commitments like neither of them have, you can make up some ground, which they have. I think the cyber threat that uh, Admiral, my battle buddy, Admiral Moran mentioned, absolutely, uh, <coughs> we assume. It's there every day right now and we assume they will go after that early on and constantly. Mm -hmm. Uh, because some of our leaders have spoken of that as a center of gravity or a, a critical capability for the U.S. So they will absolutely go after our networks, for sure. So we have to harden that and we have to train our people and change their behavior to frankly treat the network a little different than they treat it at home. Mm -hmm. On the, how do you maintain overmatch? There is a hardware technical uh, aspect to that and a classified aspect. But in this forum, ma'am, I would say, uh, People and training, although uh, not always talked about first, sometimes we talk about platforms and equipment, I would tell you people and training are, that's where it begins. Having the very best people in the Navy and the Marine Corps with the very best leaders in front of them and really hard, challenging, realistic training, that's how you maintain a margin. Very even, good. in other words, even if your equipment is peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, we, we have to train harder. We have to recruit and retain the very best. I appreciate that. So um, bottom line, we've talked a little bit about unmanned systems, hypersonic, cyber. Um, artificial intelligence would fall into this area as well. Just bottom line, if we fall into sequestration, we can guarantee all of that stops, correct? It certainly slows down to a point where we'll, we will fall further behind in some of those areas. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, General Berger, just very briefly, because I have one minute left. Um, earlier this month, the Corps concluded an experiment integrating female recruits into an all-male unit for their initial training at Paris Island. Um, can you just give me uh, a quick overview, and if confirmed, based on those results, uh, would you pursue further gender integration um, during Marine Corps Basic? Uh, that company uh, graduated a few weeks ago. Uh, with started with about 50 females as part of the company, as, mm -hmm. as uh, you, you're probably aware, ma'am. Uh, we measure the same things in every company that goes through there, how well they did physically, how many injuries they had, all those sorts of things. The, the statistics, to answer immediately your question, for this company were the same as every other company. A few areas higher, a few areas lower, but it went great. The, the program of instruction that we use in the Marine Corps, we didn't change. We just changed where they were billeted, and it, and it all worked out. I talked to the Commandant this morning about it and the results of it. I think, it, uh, and, and, our, and what I asked him is, I said, uh, you know, we have to look at this perhaps for next year, and he said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a discussion he and I will have and the Marine Corps will have, uh, but uh, the, the uh, class that entered in January and graduated a few weeks ago did very well. That's good to hear. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I, I look forward to supporting you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ernst. Senator Peters. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your uh, past service and your willingness to, to continue to, to serve. My first question uh, uh, is for Admiral Moran. Uh, you uh, uh, talked about unmanned surface uh, vessels earlier and some questions uh, that were given to you, and I know the Navy's budget requests 10 large unmanned surface vessels across future defense plans, planning at two per year beginning in uh, fiscal 2020. Uh, it's clear the Navy uh, embraces these benefits. Uh, you talked about uh, some of those benefits in a, in a previous question. But my question to you is, is how, given the fact that money is, uh, is not unlimited, uh, we do have constraints, <laughs> and those constraints uh, will be there going forward, uh, uh, particularly given the deficits that we're running in this country right now. So my, my, my question is, how, how do you see the introduction of unmanned platforms uh, impacting uh, force structure? I mean, what's kind of your vision going forward? What, what are, what's the give and take that we have with our current force uh, in terms of uh, new, now new technology being introduced? What does that look like going forward in your mind? Sir, I, the, uh, the first couple ships that we've got in the budget, uh, we, we need to get after uh, so that we can experiment with these to test out the concepts that we believe uh, they are capable of doing, looking at different types of capabilities to put on those unmanned surface vessels. Uh, we're also doing the same thing in the undersea, uh, as, as I think you know. Uh, down, down the road, if these capabilities prove out to be as effective as some other current manned capabilities, then they would start to add to the and complement the uh, the manned platforms that we have and would be part of our battle force. Uh, so I think we have to look at this carefully. We're a long ways away from understanding just how uh, effectively we can operate unmanned surface vessels in a very congested ocean, especially in parts of uh, the world where we operate day to day. So all of those will be examined as we move this deliberately but aggressively forward in the next couple of years. Well, I'll pick up on that point uh, aggressively. We, we know what's happening with autonomy in the com on the commercial side with uh, vehicles and self-driving cars, which are going to be with us a lot sooner than I think uh, people uh, realize. We also know our adversaries uh, are moving in that direction very quickly, and then you can move unmanned platforms out in a much more cost-effective way, and lethality is, uh, is present as well. So speed, I, I think, is, uh, is critical. I mean, would you agree? Yes, sir, I do. The, uh, what, what, how are you working with the private sector and academia in these, these areas? Is this primarily a Navy function, or is, are you casting a fairly wide net and bringing in expertise? Yeah, we're, we're casting a very wide net through our labs, through our engineers, through uh, Office of Naval Research. Uh, academia is very much a part of these discussions. And I think uh, most members here are aware that our labs talk extensively to academia. There's a lot of research and development that goes on through them that I think is very important as we continue to pursue this capability. Thank you. General Berger, your current position is commander of the Marine Corps Combat Development Command, which uh, describes itself, I think, as, quote, the institutional intellectual epicenter for the evolution uh, of the Marine Corps. So in responding to a question from Senator Ernst, who I serve on uh, the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee with, uh, you talked about some of the uh, emerging uh, threats and capabilities. But my question for you is, uh, is doctrine. You've thought a great deal about that. And given the change of warfare, which will likely uh, be uh, dramatic in the years ahead, from the autonomy we talk about to, to uh, hypersonic missiles, et cetera, what do, you, what do you see as some of the challenges to doctrine, and how do you think about that going forward? Uh, doctrine we think of uh, as evolutionary. It's, uh, to your point, it, it's a tough match in today's world as fast as things are changing. So I think the way that we're approaching it now, and we'll, we'll see how that goes, is uh, as fast as possible move the concepts for how we're going to operate as a naval force, Navy plus Marine Corps force move those concepts forward and experiment really, really aggressively. The doctrine will lag, I'm, I believe. Uh, but if we slow down the experimentation and the concept process uh, to the pace of doctrine, we'll fall behind. So I think the, the effort that uh, Admiral Merz and his team in the Navy and the Marine Corps has done over the past year, year and a half in really moving forward how distributed maritime ops will work, having advanced naval technology exercises and demonstrations where vendors can bring their stuff and we just put Marines and sailors in front of them and say, this is what we got to be able to do. What do you got that's close to that? That's how we're going to move fast. 
We'll bring doctrine along, but we will not allow it to drag us down like an anchor. The, uh, the current Marine Corps operating concept uh, is from uh, 2016, which was before the National Defense Strategy was published. Uh, do you see a need to uh, revise uh, that, and what would be your timetable? We, we are looking at that, Senator, but uh, in the interim since 2016, uh, two documents on the Navy Marine Corps side have helped flesh out what uh, the Marine operating concept sort of hinted at, and that's littoral operations in a contested environment and expeditionary advanced base operations. So although the, the, the Marine operating concept was sort of the yeah. beginning part of that, the two follow-on documents and then new one, distributed new maritime operations, they, they've all taken the idea further uh, in advance. So I don't know at this point if we need to rewrite the mock. Uh, the follow-on documents have helped a great deal. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Peters. Uh, Senator Sullivan. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank uh, Admiral, General, both of you for your decades of service and the service of all your family members. Great to see so many here. Thank you for uh, answering the call in these important positions. As the Chairman mentioned, you, the National Defense Strategy emphasizes the return of great power rival rivalry with China as the pacing threat in the Indo-Pacific as the primary theater. In this committee, in the last three NDAAs, has not only emphasized that, but has also emphasized and required the Department of Defense to do much more with regard to a strategic focus on the Arctic and our forces there. So what I want to do is focus a little bit of my questions in these two areas. Despite the NDS focus and the discussion of the Arctic here, the force posture of the Marine Corps in particular, but also the Navy in that region to a lot of us seems uh, stale. And by that, I mean it's pretty much, if you look at what the end of World War II left with regard to force posture, that's where our forces are pretty much right now. Um, would you agree to work with this committee on looking at ways in which to optimize the force posture of the Navy and the Marine Corps in the Arctic and in the Indo-Pacific. Admiral. Yes, sir, absolutely. We, we look at this in a strategic laydown uh, methodology. Uh, Do you agree that the, the force posture is stale, hasn't been looked at in an appropriate manner to match the NDS? To your point, Senator, the reemergence of great power competition has woken us up to, you know, take the cobwebs out from uh, lack of really paying attention, or well, I should say, uh, being able to exercise our force to be ready for that kind of competition again in the future. So uh, it is appropriate for us to continue to look at the force posture in the Indo-Pacific. General, do you agree with that in terms of the force posture and how we need to update it? I think uh, Admiral Davidson highlighted that as well in his testimony. In the ongoing DPRI effort to reposture the forces, part of that discussion. Well, we look forward to working with you, uh, this committee, on doing that. There's been a number of us who have been very focused on it. I think we're a little bit slow on this one. Let me ask, first, uh, I actually believe that the current Secretary of the Navy and the Commandant, General Neller, agree with that and the need to look at uh, reexamining our force posture. Admiral Moran, I wanted to just get your commitment to work with this committee and the Secretary of the Navy on a number of things he's committed to both in testimony and in a recent Wall Street Journal article where he talked about the need for freedom of navigation operations in the Arctic, which we haven't done in quite a long time. Large-scale amphibious exercises, again, in the Arctic, places like ADAC, looking at warming up the ADAC Navy base with regard to P-8s and the need for strategic Arctic ports. He's looked at all these issues. He's committed to work with this committee on these matters. Will you commit to work with us if confirmed on these issues as well? I, I do, Senator. And how about a commitment if confirmed to come to Alaska with me to look at the strategic terrain of the Arctic and really the gateway to the Asia Pacific as well in many of these areas? Sir, I'd love to go back to ADAC. I was there in September of this past year and uh, it, uh, unfortunately, the mothball state of that, that base uh, did not make me feel real good. Yeah, it makes you feel kind of sick at your stomach yeah, when you does. look at how strategic that base is with regard to the gateway to the Arctic and the Asia Pacific. It's a lot further west than 
uh, Midway and other places. A lot of people don't know how further west, how far west that uh, base is. General, I want to thank you for uh, very much for joining me in Alaska just last week and taking the time to come to uh, my state. I know you've been up there before. The Marine Corps, as you know, has a proud and distinguished history of serious cold weather operations, whether it, you know, Chosen Reservoir or Inchon, every climbing place is part of our hymn. Um, General Neller has been concerned about how the Marine Corps has lost its ability to co conduct large-scale operations in the cold weather. You may have seen, and I'd like to submit this for the record, Mr. Chairman, the U.S. Naval Institute uh, had an article about the Marine Corps' uh, recent 24th Mew exercises with regard to cold weather ops that were uh, a lot of challenges came out. So General Neller and Secretary and the Secretary of the Navy have been interested in significantly increasing training and deployment opportunities in Alaska to help address what I think most would agree is kind of an atrophy of Marine Corps skill sets. Would you work in terms of cold weather operations, would you uh, commit to work with this committee on looking at the opportunities to do more training in Alaska, more training at Jay Park? Uh, as you know, the national defense strategy has Russia, China, North Korea as some of our biggest adversaries that we need to focus on. These are cold weather, mountain terrain areas. Um, would you commit to continuing those policies to look at those opportunities with this committee? Senator, I will commit to work with the committee closely on any kind of training that, ha that benefits our combat readiness. Yes, sir. How about more specifically, General Neller had focused on having no less than seven Arctic cold weather battalions in the Marine Corps. He talked about Marine Corps planning was looking at rotational forces through Norway and Alaska to re- uh, establish this very important fighting skill. Would you commit to working with this committee on fully exploring those opportunities and needs of the Marines? Mm -hmm. Senator, I think if confirmed, I would do the same thing as General Neller, which is look at what the nation through the secretary and chairman require of the Marine Corps, figure out where we're meeting that mark in terms of capability and capacity and where we're not. I will absolutely commit to working with the the committee on any areas where, in my view, in the Marine Corps' view, we don't, we don't have the capacity. Do you think the Marine Corps' cold weather, extreme large-scale cold weather skill, mountainous terrain, has atrophied over the last 20 years? 20 years ago, I don't know the capacity, how many battalions were trained in cold weather. I know it's a critical training requirement for the Marine Corps, as is operating in the jungle, and it's not transferable. It's a, it's a skill that you can... If you don't practice it, it'll atrophy fast. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Senator Kane. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the witnesses. I just returned with eight other senators from a CODEL led by Senator Leahy to Elmendorf uh, Air Force Base in Alaska, Korea, uh, Vietnam, Guam, and Indo-PACOM in uh, Hawaii. And I just want to say it was an amazing visit, a lot of takeaways, some for this committee, some for foreign relations, strong, passionate advocacy for U.S. ratification of law of the sea treaty because of uh, opportunities that were missing in the Arctic and also uh, need to challenge Chinese island building in the East Sea off the east coast of Vietnam. A lot of discussion about aircraft carriers. Um, uh, in Vietnam, we're advocating for a, another aircraft carrier visit. There's been one before in Da Nang Harbor. And so I know Senator Cotton asked some questions about the Truman decision, but Admiral Moran, I just want to kind of underline those. When we have strategic discussions, either in this setting or classified, we're often being told that, especially in the Indo-PACOM area, that our carriers are, you know, one of the most important parts of our arsenal. And so when we have that briefing on the strategic side, and then we see a budget that proposes to start to move toward not refueling the Truman and mothballing it at sort of its half-life, I, th I think there's a lot of questions on both sides of the aisle in the committee. It's just kind of a head-scratcher for us. So I suspect that we'll be discussing that pretty heavily as committee this month when we work on the NDA. I wanted to ask you about a question that you and I uh, talked about briefly yesterday. There have been a series of reports recently, one following the 
NATO Trident Juncture exercise in November 2018 in the Baltics, and then one more recently that Russia is now using cyber attacks to go after the GPS systems of our own military assets, but also commercial shipping. Um, there was attempted cyber attacks during the Trident Juncture exercise in, in Norway and in the Baltics and Finland, the areas there, uh, but there's been a more recent report in March of uh, a, a fairly systematic analysis of Russian cyber attacks on GPS systems. I know the after action report on the Fitzgerald and McCain collisions concluded that there was no cyber attack on their systems, the systems of those ships that led to those collisions. Were you able to rule out whether there had been any cyber attack on the GPS systems of the commercial vessels that the Fitzgerald and McLean, uh, McCain collided with? Yes, sir. <clears throat> I have, I have a, uh, a classified response for you that I will provide to you and your staff. But in general, we looked at the, the functionality of the commercial GPS system uh, in the Pacific at the time of the two collisions, mm -hmm. which would have affected both the uh, commercial vessels and the United States Navy, right. uh, and that did not occur. Um, okay. I cannot confirm for you uh, whether there was hacking uh, on board the ship uh, on the commercial vessels. <coughs> that is not within our purview to investigate. Right. But but based on the tracks and based on the investigation, we don't see evidence of that. Let me ask, um, without going into details about what you're doing, knowing that Russia is engaged in cyber attack on GPS systems of ships, um, are you comfortable that? the Navy and our military more generally is taking the steps that we need to do to protect ourselves and also to offer information to commercial vessels to protect themselves against these kinds of cyber attacks, which can have very dangerous consequences. Yes, sir. I am comfortable, uh, but I, I, to your, the premise of your question here, the Russians are bad actors in this, in this area, and they are coming after us in every conceivable way uh, to make it more challenging, more difficult at sea and in other places. GPS is one method, but I'm comfortable we are technically uh, answering uh, the mail on this system. Um, I appreciate that, and it may be in a classified setting. We'll want to dig in further to exactly how we're countering this threat. Uh, I, I appreciate both of you here together. I think as the as the we're doing a, a an assessment of force structure and how to get to a 355 ship Navy and we're looking at manned and unmanned and surface and sub and amphib and destroyers and carriers and all the platforms. I just wanna make sure that the Navy and the Marines are completely on the same song sheet when the plan is developed and when we are asked to fund that. Um, I definitely want you two to be exactly in the same position feeling that the plan is as it should be. General Berger, I have a question or two for you. I read a, an article recently that I was very interested in uh, written by a major, uh, major Spader in a publication that I wasn't familiar with before, but it was just a, an interesting article. Was it the, um, the publication is called War on the Rocks, and the, and, the public, and the article, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, Sir, Who Am I? An Open Letter to the Incoming Commandant of the Marine Corps. I, I don't want to summarize it because there's a lot of good points in there, but I, I think maybe a main point is the Marines are our Swiss Army knife. They do everything, but sometimes trying to be everything to everybody is a real challenge. And so we have to be, Marines have to be first to fight and, and, you, and you have to be flexible in dealing with the challenges. We focused on terrorism, now it's great power competition, but the bombing in Sri Lanka shows that ISIS is, if they're not holding a caliphate, they're nevertheless still active all over the globe. How do you uh, approach that question of not wanting to just be everything to everybody as, as a nominee to be Commandant? It was a, a fascinating article. There's, there's more venues now for creative uh, people to write, and they're all good. I think they, they ask questions that were asked internally, but now there's a means for them to ask them out loud. Uh, the the basic, uh, basics of it for me, Senator, to answer your question, we're, we know what our pacing threat is. And that doesn't mean necessarily we're arming up to go after them or them after us, but that's the bar we must measure ourselves against. Now, all other missions are not uh, subsets of that, but we can adapt. If we have the force that matches up against a peer adversary and maintains a margin of overmatch so that it's not a fair fight, like General Dunford says, as long as we're there, we can adapt that force to do any other mission we're assigned. But the opposite is not true. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. 
Uh, Senator Perdue. General, I appreciate your comment. Um, we never want to send our, our kids um, into a fair fight, and you've said that repeatedly in here. 27 March 1794, this Congress passed the, the Naval Act of 1794, and it authorized six ships to be built, first six ships in our history. They happened to be frigates, and they were, that was a very controversial decision, as I understand it, at that time. Today, I'd like to talk about two things real quick, the need and then our ability to fund it. Those six ships cost us $688,000. Um, today, we're in a different game. I'd like to talk about first the buildup that China has and how we can have that overmatch, General, both in the Marines and in the Navy, Admiral, um, when in 30 years we're seeing that they're going to have about 100 more, surface, or 100 more ships in total. Professor Andrew Erickson of the Naval War College has actually said that his estimate is that they will be quantitatively larger and qualitatively on par with us by 2030. Do you both agree with that statement? And if so, how do you plan to deal with the fact that you know, they're, being, they're able to bring ships quicker and cheaper to bear than we are in the procurement process. They're not limited by the funding things that I want to get to in a second. So if you'll uh, address that, and I'd like to hear that, hear uh, your response from both of you, if you don't mind. Admiral? Senator, uh, great question. I, I think uh, it's pretty clear to all of us that, the, that our military advantage over the last 17 years in this great power competition against high-end adversaries like, like China, uh, potential adversaries like China, uh, our, our advantage has eroded uh, in, in many different ways, both in terms of quantity and, uh, and in terms of modernization. The quality of our force that's modernized, trained, manned, and, and equipped uh, the way we are on a path to do right now, um, I would take anywhere, anytime against anyone who wants to take us on. Together, uh, not just the Navy Marine Corps team, but the Joint Force, and you had in the Air Force uh, and the Army, uh, it's, it's incredibly powerful uh, in this great power co competition. So um, we have to maintain pace on modernizing the fleet with capabilities that can counter the uh, capabilities that are being generated by China. And you're, China. you're confident then and by 2030 with the NDS strategy right now, 355 ships, that we can do that with 100 deficit to the China's capability? Yes, sir, I do. Thank you. General? Sir, uh, the technological part of it, there's a, obviously an unclassified and a classified yes, sir. portion to that answer. Um, and I mentioned before, so I won't cover it again, the importance of realistic training and the ability of the Navy Marine Corps team to operate together and as a joint force. No one can compete with us right now on that level. Now, they're going to work hard to get to us, but right now uh, we can operate in a way that they cannot, but we should not take for granted and we shouldn't sit on our laurels neither. The, the, the middle ground, of course, between us is partners and allies, which you didn't mention, but we have to work hard to make sure we are the best partner, the best ally, every single day, every week. So it is partly a function of system versus system, numbers versus numbers, but there's a, another aspect to it in terms of who can help a region maintain security framework that exists that's so successful. Right now it's the U.S. We have to work hard every day to ensure that the partners and allies in Admiral Davidson's case in Indo-PACOM yeah. and the other combatant areas, that no matter how far another country advances, that that collective framework is strong enough to deter any, any bad actors. Yes, sir. I wish we had more time, but on the funding side of this, um, I want to address this. Senator Worker brought it up, but I want to highlight it again and get your response to just two quick questions if you don't mind. First, uh, Admiral, in terms of uh, procurement, we actually have some flexibility. You have some flexibility to go multi-year. When it comes to O&M, you do not. Would you agree to go through a pilot program that would allow some flexibility with regard to operation and maintenance funding? Uh, Senator, I would be delighted to have a, a pilot that we could exercise that concept against because I think it would send a very strong message to industry partners uh, that we're, we're going to commit to them at a, at a higher level than we can do under the current. Probably program. save some money, too, would you agree? Well, no question. Yes, sir. sir in, in the last uh, 45 years, since 1974, when the Budget Act was put in place under which we fund our government today, including our military, we have used a continuing resolution 187 times. 
I would love for both of you, and I have asked every person in uniform who comes before this committee and the Budget Committee to help us understand, because I am not sure that we do, how detrimental that really is. We have 34 working days. We are staring there down the barrel of a gun right now. Uh, this year, for the last two years, we have been able to avoid continued resolution. I think that has played some significant role in your ability to, to recover on the readiness front. However, we could lose all of that momentum, in my opinion, having been around this now for four years. I believe we could lose a lot of that momentum just this year if we are not able to fund by September 30th and we end up doing a CR. I have even heard people here talk politically about using a CR through the 2020 election, which would be November of next year. Can you both help us understand how detrimental that would be to what we are doing with readiness and also trying to rebuild our Navy and Marine Corps? Senator, this is uh we don't even like talking about it. Uh, it's it's so devastating to our ability to plan and program and have predictable outcomes in the future. Would you both provide the committee with uh, get your staff to provide a committee that would give us a summary of how that would impact you this year? I know the general has a very important helicopter coming this year, uh, ready for delivery. Uh, could be delayed if we have a CR in September. Uh, could you would you both commit to do that? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you. One last thing, uh, General. Dynamic force deployment, and this is for you too, Admiral. We talked about it, uh, and you were gracious enough to allow me to go visit the, the Truman the other day, and I was so impressed. Just like I am, every, every time I see our uniform men and women around the world, the best, and I mean the very best, of what we produce in America is under your command, and I thank you for that. You have survived a pyramid of performance to get here today. Your families deserve the credit. I just, last question, the, the, the dynamic force deployment, Help me understand and how that balances off with the operational um, unpredictability, which is, I think, what Secretary Mattis was talking about when he brought this up to begin with. Can you help us understand how you plan to balance those two? You want to start? I will, sir. Uh, very quickly, dynamic force employment for us as services, uh, working with the chairman and the secretary, is a way of becoming more operationally unpredictable in the way that you describe. In other words, we have a set pattern for when we're going to deploy regular units, and intermixed in that is dynamic force employment, which the intent of which is to keep potential adversaries, competitors a little bit questioning, um, make us less predictable <clears throat> operationally. To get there, though, requires uh, resources on our part, requires a degree of training, because these are not programmed into the regular deployment cycle very far in advance. So we have to work very closely with the chairman I think in the secretary to understand where they want to do it and when and make sure we have the forces ready and the resources available to do it. Yes, sir, I'll just add that uh, with our first effort on dynamic force employment with the Harry S. Truman Strike Group that you, you've got a bit of an insight to when you visited there, uh, is we're, we're, we re are relearning a lot of lessons we used to do in the Cold War. Sorry, That's how we employed the force back then. Uh, and to relearn those lessons on logistics, supply and chain, and uh, uh, end supply chain, all of those types of mechanisms, we they've been in hibernation for 17 years, and now we're we're bringing them back. So there's some there's some learning here that's going on that is very important. So the benefits of doing this uh, uh, employment scheme are not only the unpredictability for our adversaries, but the predictability on how we're going to operate in that environment in the future. All right, all right. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As part of my responsibility as a member of this committee and to ensure the fitness of nominees for appointment to senior positions within the DOD, I ask uh, the following two questions of, in fact, all nominees before any of the five committees on which I sit. So I'll ask both of you. Since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement related to this kind of conduct? No, ma'am. No. This is for Admiral Moran. Uh, the Navy has committed to a significant plan to modernize our four public shipyards, of which Pearl Harbor is one, as you well know. I commend this action as a needed step to ensure our shipyards can accomplish the maintenance and support that our fleets need to accomplish their mission. So, Admiral Moran, first, your thoughts about the modernization efforts and your commitment to the plan should you be confirmed. Uh, fully committed to the plan, Senator, and um, I, we, we have it funded in our current uh, presidential budget request, and 
We will continue to fund that program because it is vital to the foundation of our ability to maintain the force in the future. And as we talk about a 355-ship Navy, uh, we, we not only need to uh, uh, build new ships, but we better maintain the ones that we already have. So the, our shipyards are very critical to that. Uh, I know that Senators uh, Reed and King have talked to you. Uh, this is again for you, Admiral to you about the uh, shipyard tragedies, and I think you responded that the recommendations were well on their way to be enacted. And uh, the, the, there are a number of uh, recommendations. And however, I had heard that the staffing within the uh, Connect personnel in the Pacific fleets was not to the levels that they were in the Atlantic and other fleets, making deployments and readiness levels more challenging in the Pacific fleets. So going forward, how will the Navy ensure that ships and crews will be out there with the best chance to succeed in terms of the level of staffing as well as having the right mix of sailors? Uh, Senator, the, at the time of the mishaps, um, you, you are correct. Uh, and that was brought out in the comprehensive review and the strategic readiness review. We, uh, the manning levels uh, in Seventh Fleet had dropped uh, to a level that was unsustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in a much better place today. The FDNF ships in Japan are manned at a higher level than any other place in the fleet. Uh, they are meeting all their fit and fill requirements, which is the right sailor with the right skill set uh, and uh, approaching the right level of experience. We have taken a, 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 a number of personnel policy changes to include extending the overseas tours for our first term sailors there. Uh, that is making a, a difference on the waterfront, but we're a year and a half into this, and we're we're monitoring it every day. The three-star type commander in San Diego looks at this every single day, so I'm confident we're on the right track, and we'll continue to watch it. And, and we have a requirement mm -hmm. to report to Congress uh, when things uh, change up and down. Thank you, and I think I think we have to maintain uh, that that level of diligence because we can't uh, have any more of the kind of tragedies that we've uh, experienced. Uh, the Pacific Missile Range Facility, again for you, Admiral Moran, uh, continues to be an outstanding facility, and it's the only range in the world that's capable of traffic traffic tracking surface, subsurface, air, and space simultaneously. And my hope is that the Navy continues to treat PMRF as a priority. How valuable is PMRF to the Navy and organizations such as the Missile Defense Agency for testing, evaluation, and readiness? And if confirmed, can I have your commitment that you will continue to support, um, P, to support PMRF and uh, what it uh, represents? Senator, I've got a readiness. lot of time on Barrister Range out there off uh, PMRF. Uh, to your point, it's a very important range. It allows us to uh, teach and train our crews how to track submarines, how to track uh, airborne threats, uh, and of course, Missile Defense Agency is also heavily invested out there. It is a vital component of our national defense. Thank you. With, uh, with all of the um, aspects of it, uh, there, there have been, of course, in the past some discussion about operationalizing Aegis Ashore on PNRF, and that would de definitely, I, I would say, limit the capacity, if not to totally eliminate the, the capacity of PMRF to, pro to provide the kind of, of, of um, testing facilities that we currently have. So uh, <laughs> you're nodding your head, yes. I, well, I, what I'm nodding <laughs> my head is uh, it's an area that I've got to dig into. If confirmed, I will look at it very hard, uh, very aggressively to make sure that we're not interrupting the training we get there with the capability you described. One more question for you. Uh, as you probably know, I have been working with the Secretary of Defense, um, Secretary of the Navy, rather, and current uh, uh, others, and uh, well, Admiral Richardson, in uh, bringing the Navy ROTC to the University of Hawaii, because as we talk about the importance of diversifying our military, uh, the Hawaii, as you know, is a very diverse population. So if confirmed, will you agree to take a good look at the opportunities that the University of Hawaii and the Navy could um, uh, capitalize on, the, on, on taking this step and to, to work with me to um, effect that? Senator, we've had this discussion. I am absolutely willing to work with you. We're going to need your help, though, 
in terms of uh, it's very difficult for us to close down ROTC units. Well, my to I was told that you don't need to close down another existing uh, ROTC in order to set up the one at the University of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So if that's your understanding, please. Uh, no, it's, it's not that. It's just limited resources, and we ought, to, we ought to disestablish the underperforming ones and look for opportunities like you're talking about in Hawaii. Also, I think there was some money uh, previously uh, to set up an ROTC program uh, at the University of Hawaii, and there were some issues relating to uh, what actually was provided. So I would like to, of course, work with you to um, move that um, issue forward. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rono. Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, uh, thank you for being here. Congratulations again on your nominations, and thank you for your exemplary service. I want to return to something that you said in response to Senator King, which I think is extremely important, and that is the increasing, the increasing dependence in the joint force on an increasingly narrow slice of the American population. I think, Admiral, you mentioned that 84 percent of, of servicemen and women currently come from legacy military families. And um, it also strikes me that regionally, and you both talked about the regional balance of recruitment, regionally we are increasingly dependent on families, volunteers, recruits from the Middle West and the South. This strikes me as a, as a very serious concern because we've talked on the committee all day today about uh, the various challenges uh, that we face as a country and the various challenges placed on the joint force, in, including uh, the uh, fatigue that uh, both of the services you will uh, soon oversee have experienced in the last 17 and 18 years, particularly yours, General, uh, due to the counterinsurgency threat and fight. And those are being borne by an increasingly narrow slice, again, of the American public. What are we going to do about that? And, and I want to invite you to, to, to speak a little more broadly. I think we sometimes talk of it as if it's a military problem, and you know, the military needs to do this, that, or the other. It strikes me it really is a society-wide problem. I mean, that, that we have a society that's increasingly disengaged and separate from the mission that we ask you to perform every day. What, what do we need? What needs to change in order to re-engage more and more of our citizens in this crucial task of defending our country? Uh, I'll start off first. Uh, some of the things that I've seen us do in the last five or six years, I think, are headed in the right direction. Um, the Third Fleet puts on, uh, uh, puts together a force that sails out of San Diego and Camp Pendleton and goes up to um, San Francisco, um, Seattle, a couple of other places, and they spend a week there. And this is a way I found, because I, I wasn't familiar with that, but going up there to see the Marines who are embarked on the ship, A, they get good training, because there's a Navy Marine Corps team, you're embarked, you're able to operate. But B, for a whole week, they flood the zone in the community with Marines and sailors, and there's no filters in between them, there's no barriers. It begins to break down the, I don't know what those military people are all about, sort of thing you're, you're, you're focused on. I think they're a step in the right direction. The recruiting uh, is, is a, uh, he, the Admiral knows uh, every bit, more, probably more than I do, it is a week in and week out battleground for very uh, highly qualified talent. I don't think that's going to get any easier. Uh, we know what we need, and we need to draw it from as many parts of society as we can get, um, but it is getting harder and harder. Uh, we cannot, we can't, I agree with you, we can't shrink into a portion of the country and that become our base. That's a really bad place to head to. Admiral, do you want to add anything to that? I, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to top what yeah. General Berger just yeah. talked about. Yes, sir. Well, th thank you for that, General. And I, I think it's important to underscore that we cannot continue to ask a narrowing slice of, of this country to fight our nation's wars, uh, to defend our nation's people. It's just not sustainable to bear all of that burden. And I think we as a society have to take a long, hard look at how we've gotten to this place. Let me shift to ask a, a few more specific questions um, about uh, the national defense strategy. Admiral, let me start with you. We've talked about uh, aircraft carriers uh, quite a bit here this morning. Let me ask you about aircraft carrier lethality in the context of the NDS and in the context of the Indo-Pacific, China in particular. What are your views on, as, as you come soon to this position, what are your views on what we should be doing, need to be doing about making the carrier more lethal in the context of the China fight in particular? Senator, thanks for the question. Uh, 
the, the combat lethality of the aircraft carrier in, extends from the air wing. Uh, the, the carrier obviously is the airfield, the platform, and a fantastic group of sailors that make it all happen. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, our, it's the lethality resident within the air wing and a combination of different capabilities, starting with the quarterback, which is the E2D, that's a uh, surveillance aircraft, uh, targeting aircraft, uh, to the growlers, which provide uh, electromagnetic warfare capabilities that are vital to the fight that we see coming. Uh, and of course, with our Super Hornets at the fourth gen plus level, and as well as the fifth gen F-35Cs, that's a pretty powerful combination. I feel very comfortable about that. Uh, where we are trying to regain our superiority is in our, in our weapons that are carried uh, by that air wing. Uh, longer range, uh, more networked, uh, all of the things that will make us very effective against a uh, pretty tough adversary at, at the high end. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for that, Admiral. General, let me ask you, um, again, in the context of, of the NDS, we ask uh, the Marine Corps to do, to be the Swiss Army knife of the Joint Force in many ways, to do so much in so many areas. Um, as we think about the, the peer pacing threat, as you put it, in the Indo-Pacific with China, what do you think needs to be done uh, for to see the Corps become uh, the blunt, more a part of the blunt layer force in, in, the, in the Asian theater in particular? Uh, I would uh, lift it up uh, just a half a degree, Senator, and, and really approach it from a naval force rather than a Marine Corps view. And this, this thinking on the Navy Marine Corps team is about maybe two, two and a half, three years old. That contact to blunt force, that layer of forward deployed naval forces is the best deterrent I know of. And it's instantly convertible to an offensive defensive capability if you have to go there. So what do we have to do? We have to practice the concepts that are outlined in, in, in distributed maritime operations. We have to develop the logistics to sustain a more distributed force. We have to harden our network so that we can communicate within that force laterally. And frankly, last part is uh, exercise what our doctrine has always told us, which is um, empower subordinate commanders to make decisions in lieu of other orders and let them go. Uh, in other words, train that way all the time. We, we, our doctrine says we do that, but um, we probably, we can't do enough training at the level where you give broad guidance to subordinates, tell them what you want to accomplish, and let them go. And then we'll talk about afterwards how you might have done it differently. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Sen Senator uh, Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Admiral Moran, can you um, update the committee on the state of uh, our military sea lift, uh, cargo ready reserve, and prepositioned fleet? I, I just feel like as I look at the defense budget um, from the last few years, I'm concerned about what I see as an underinvestment um, in this critical capability. And, and I just wonder if you share these concerns and um, does the U.S. have enough capacity, for example, and capability to efficiently move our forces across the Atlantic or the Pacific with those great distances um, to face a potential adversary? And if confirmed, how would you recommend correcting this serious decline in our transportation fleet, if you agree with me? Senator, it's a great question, and it's one that has our attention uh, as we have begun to update how we're going to operate with distributed maritime operations. Under our current requirements, we have enough capacity uh, to meet our O-Plan requirements, uh, but that capacity is very old, and we, we cannot keep riding those ships harder and harder. So we are looking at ways to upgrade uh, by both buying, it's a combination of buying some used vessels that have a lot of life left on them, as well as uh, designing and building a new, new sea lift capability. So we're underway in a program called CHAMPS, and I'd happy to come brief you on that. That is a design of uh, sea lift capability that will uh, answer a lot of different aspects of how you replenish and resupply at sea. Uh, and that combination of some of the authorities that this body has authorized us to do in terms of buying used um, while we pursue the new, uh, the new ca capacity is also important. So, uh, it is very much on our minds as we look at this. 
Could you discuss the, the time frame that you're talking about, both with the buying use and, and, and developing new? Because, you know, if we look at great power competition, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're in it now. And, and Asia is certainly, the Chinese are out there right now in the Pacific. And I don't think people understand the great distances uh, that we talk about in the Pacific. So can you sort of go over sort of the, the timeline of, 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 the, of what you're trying to do here? We're trying to get an investment plan put in place in this fight up to in, be able to start delivering on these things later, uh, not long after this current uh, fiscal year defense plan. So the planning, the contracting, the design, the build for the, the models that I talked about on the new side um, will take a little while to, to ferret out and make sure we have the requirements right. Uh, on the use side, we are looking at, in, in this next budget cycle, ways to invest in buy and used and we're working with Congress to make sure that, that, that that's well understood, because there are issues with buying used, especially from foreign vendors, uh, mm -hmm. where, where the prices are, are very reasonable uh, that we are, we are actively pursuing. Okay, thank you. I would love that brief if you have a chance to do that. Thank you. Um, General Berger, the, um, as, as my as, um, colleague, uh, uh, Senator Ernst, mentioned um, about the um, graduating the first integrated recruit training company down in Paris Island. Um, the Marine Corps did this. Um, and I really agree that this was an important progress in achieving a lethal force that is based solely on demonstrated performance and not on personal characteristics or religion or race or gender. Um, I feel that a great nation must embrace its citizens who are willing to put on the uniform and defend their country. So if confirmed to be commandant, how would you succeed where others have fallen short in transforming the culture of the Marines to embrace a truly integrated fighting force? Because you really came into the Marine Corps you know, in, in the 80s and, and, and you've seen this change happening um, and, and the culture is shifting, and you've seen us go from where people talked about a front line, you could hide, you know, you could put the women back here, and, and they could do these support jobs, but there are no front lines anymore. So how, how are you going to be able to succeed as Commandant to change the culture overall of the Marine Corps as you move forward to truly make this integrated force um, one that is, that, you know, faces the modern reality of you can't fight without the women in your force? Uh, thanks, Senator. I think we're on our way. Uh, thanks partly to this committee and Congress in um, emphasizing it and uh, the service in finding ways to uh, open up occupational specialties and units that w women couldn't serve in five years ago. That pressure from Congress was, is healthy, is good. Today, um, there's almost 500 women who were in units that they could not have been in five years ago, weren't allowed to, and that will only grow. We have 200 Marines who have specialties that they couldn't have five years ago. That will only grow. I think all of us go into an organization and we want to see role models. We want to see people sort of like us be successful. I think the more that of our units that beforehand were uh, uh, male only, the more they, more Marines see females in that. That at, as that goes on, I think to your point, at the end of the day. Marines just care, did, can you get the job done? Mm -hmm. This is the standard, the standard, and is everybody measured against that? And that's the way it must be. I think the more they see Marines in infantry units and artillery units, and they don't care, like to your point, what gender, uh, what race, where they came from, what hometown, can you, can you carry the load? Can you do the job? That's all that matters. Thank you. Um, shifting gears a little bit, as you know, forcible entry amphibious operations have become daunting propositions in today's anti-access and, and um, access denial um, environment. In your opinion, in this era, how must we improve the Marine Corps progr programmatically and organizationally to ensure that we can execute and, and oppose amphibious landing against a potential adversaries like China, North Korea, and Iran? Again, looking at where you're going, I want to make sure you have that capability. Just uh, quickly, ma'am, we're, we're never going to pick a symmetric uh, fight. We're going to find, the commanders will find ways so that they have an advantage. In other words, we're not going to do another Tarawa or another Iwo Jima. We're going to find a way, if we're tasked to do so, to do a forcible entry in a way that we have the advantage. We need to fight distributed. We need connectors that we don't have right now that will allow us to move the force from amphibious ships to the shore, spread them out shore to shore. So the family of surface and aerial connectors, that's got to change. That's got to grow. And as far as the training, uh, that 
Finding the training environments, the realistic training environments is really tough. A place where there's littorals that represents a spread out area and where you can do high-end training that the Navy Marine Corps needs to do. Uh, we're going to need all the help from this committee we can in making sure that those training areas are, are available to us to train at. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for being here and for your service. Congratulate to, uh, congratulations to you and your family for your nominations. Um, Donald Berger, thank you for the time we spent in the office. Uh, we covered a lot of the landscape there, so I just want to go back and talk about one thing that we discussed in the office that has to do with actually two aspects to Camp Lejeune. One is, I think, the consensus uh, need for the recovery from the hurricane damage that I believe is somewhere in the $3 billion range. Um, and then the other one was family housing, which was damaged, but we had a problem before the storm. The, the storm, in some respects, masked a fundamental problem that we now know that we have with military uh, family housing across the country. Um, so one, I'd like to get your, uh, just again, your uh, assessment of the need for the storm recovery down at uh, Camp Lejeune, and then two, your personal commitment when you get in there that we're going to continue to do the good work that we started a few months ago when this problem became obvious. For the storm recovery, Senator, first, uh, you're correct. The total bill, I think the Commandant uh, has been clear, is, is about 3.6 or 3.7 billion. We're using uh, some reprogramming authorities that we've been given this year to begin to pay what we can. We will need supplemental funds to rebuild Camp Lejeune. And Camp Lejeune is directly tied to combat readiness. So if we, if we can't rebuild uh, the facilities and training areas that we need and the family housing that's got to happen at Camp Lejeune, there's a direct impact to readiness. And Commandant Neller, you know, like a, a good Marine, uh, I asked him about the condition of some of these buildings that we have Marines operating in. He, he, you know, he said that it was a sort of expeditionary uh, <clears throat> Conditions are accustomed to it. That's fine when you're deployed. It's not fine when you're on U.S. soil. So we've got to make sure that we do everything we can to get them up to a, a sound, operational, safe shape and soon. And you have my commitment to do everything I can on my side of the dais to do that. Um, Admiral Morin, Morin, I had a question for you about uh, it's it's deep in the weeds, so I wouldn't necessarily expect you to answer the, uh, the specific, but, but more generally, uh, the Dare County bombing range down in uh, North Carolina. Uh, I, I worked, I served in the legislature before I came up here, and one priority that I placed as Speaker of the House is we didn't allow encroachment on our basis. Anything that would make you think twice about completing your training missions, uh, we made it very clear as a matter of state policy that that was uh, unacceptable. Uh, now I hear that there are some proposals for some wind farms in and around the Dare County bombing range that could potentially impact, uh, could, I, I'm not saying will, but could potentially impact uh, the uh, training operations down there. And what I've heard to this point, I've got to call out to Secretary Spencer because I'd like to know fairly quickly whether or not it would raise a concern because the legislature is prepared to act if it is a real concern. Obviously, we don't want to stand in the way where it makes sense, but I definitely don't want anything standing in the way when it doesn't let you all do your mission as safely and as completely as possible. So do I have your commitment? If, if you have specific knowledge now, I'd like to hear it. Generally, I think encroachment is a concern in a number of areas across the United States, and but I have your commitment to look into this when you're confirmed. I'm convinced both of you will be, incidentally. Senator, yes, you have my commitment. Thank you very much. And, and again, similar to the situation we have down at uh, Camp Lejeune on military housing, it's not just about Camp Lejeune. That just happens to be in my backyard. But uh, we've got to make sure that with the service secretaries and, and the leadership uh, that we're keeping the foot on the pedal. Because here's how I think this all plays out. A lot of people will come up and blame it on the housing providers, the private sector. I think they had a role to play. But I also believe that the Department and Congress also had roles to play. And we've got to look at this as not having that guy fix his problem because I'm okay and recognize what state we were in when we went to private housing. And that was not an acceptable state. We've got to fix it. And the way we fix it is not only look at the other guy who's got to fix his problems or her problems, but you all need to look internally and you need to look at us and see actions that we've taken that made it more difficult to make sure these military families have adequate housing. So I want both of your commitments 
on pursuing this aggressively. I don't like operating in terms of months. I want days and weeks to start showing positive progress and then get something in place over the next few months. Yes, sir. Sir, you do. Thank you all. I came in late. Uh, I'll have an opportunity to follow up uh, with you, Admiral. And again, uh, uh, General Berger, thank you for being in my office. Again, thank you for your service and uh, take care of our troops. Oh, and I should say, our, always our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, you know, I thank you all for your service. Yeah, that's the first. <laughs> All right, thank you, Senator Tillis. I appreciate it and appreciate the patience and the, um, the, the performance of both of our witnesses. We look forward to serving with you in the capacity. We thank your families for being here and for their endurance also, and we are adjourned. Thank you.